As we see copper below $4, you know, at $3.66, I'm starting to wonder to myself, why don't we just buy it at these prices? You know, from a governmental perspective, from a corporate perspective, whoever thinks they need the metal for the next 10 years, frankly, you know, if you're waiting for the $2.50 copper, it might happen, but it might not. You know, it's kind of like buying Bitcoin. People are like, just buy it because you never know when it's going to take off here. So whether it's 30000 or 20000 just get on the train. And I kind of feel that way about copper, for example, and many of these metals. I mean, as we're going to see in metal prices. And hello and welcome back to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli. We have a wonderful show for you here today. We have Jessica Leventhal and Anthony Vaccaro who give us a preview of the Precious Metals Summit in Zurich coming up. It's actually in about a week here, November 13th to 15th, Zurich and Energy Transition Day. The Northern Miner is going to collaborate on the last day with the energy transition part. Anthony Vaccaro is going to explain that. And of course, CEO of the Precious Metals Summit, Jessica Leventhal, is also going to join us. So super interesting to hear what's going on over there and how the Precious Metals Summit tailors itself to a European perspective. So a very interesting interview there. And also we have Frank Justra, who is interviewed by Northern Miner Editor-in-Chief Alicia Hyatt at the Canadian Mining Symposium in London. And that is also very interesting. A lot of geopolitics, dollar hegemony, BRICS, all that stuff that we have come to appreciate here as we zoom out and look at the big picture of the world stage and the critical role that natural resources play in this unfolding drama. So a lot to look forward to here today. Zooming out on the markets a little bit, I mean, as I was starting out this episode, again, like lithium, we've been looking at lithium at like $22 a kilogram. We'll get an update on that in the metal price section But I have this story here from Bloomberg News. Battery metals lose luster as surge in supply outpaces demand. So if I'm the CEO of Ford, I'm sort of going, why aren't we just stocking up for the next 10 years? Like if we think we're going to need this and if we hit a recession, well, I mean, does copper really go bad? I suppose you have to store it, but it doesn't seem like the worst thing in the world to have some warehouses of copper. I guess maybe you need some security. But I assume they already have a certain amount of infrastructure for storing these things. Maybe you just build it out a bit. Even from a defense perspective, one would think it's a time to stock up. This is good news. I mean, if you're Tesla, if you're Elon Musk, battery metals lose luster as surge in supply outpaces demand. You got to be jumping up and down for joy, right? And it's kind of another lesson, too. And be careful with sentiment, as we're going to see in this article. Actually, let's take a quick look here. In the fast-moving world of battery metals, 2022 already feels like a bygone era. Back then, prices were soaring, automakers were fretting about long-term shortages, and Elon Musk was describing lithium costs as quote-unquote insane. A year and a half on from Tesla's CEO's comments, the market dynamics for metals crucial to the energy transition have flipped. Lithium has tumbled almost 70% so far this year. I think they called it white gold, while nickel has plummeted around 40%. Cobalt, too, has dropped. The trio of electric vehicle battery ingredients is now among the worst performing in the commodity universe. So a true lesson here in sentiment. When you start hearing words like insane, genius, it is time to sell. That is what I have learned Not financial advice, that is what I have learned over my brief, you know, 12 years of investing. Maybe longer, actually, at this point. 14, 15 years of investing. When you hear insane, when you hear genius, it is time to sell. Let's continue here, though, because this is a very important, I mean, again, and I feel it's important to say, to point this out, this article, because all we've been hearing about for the last four or five years is how critical metal shortage and it's all going to run out and what are we going to do? And then sure enough, as night follows day, sentiment changes, the story shifts. It's almost like you could just, whatever's being hyped, you could just do the opposite. 
hello, Bitcoin, $69,000, right? And when Bitcoin's going to zero, I guess it's time to buy. I mean, it really is kind of that simple, although it sounds a lot easier than it actually is. But now applying that, though, to our current situation, if these metals start to become unloved, well, maybe there's an opportunity there because maybe that's like the start of what we're seeing. And now let's see what the explanation is here. The trio of electric vehicle battery ingredients is now among the worst performing in the commodity universe, laid low by slowing sales growth for electric vehicles, as well as supply increases coming out of China, Indonesia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The turnaround in fortunes is a reminder that the path to cleaner fuels is unlikely to be a smooth one. Now, I do, you know, little red flags come up when I hear supply increases coming out of China, because we know. One of the playbooks here, and we've kind of figured out a few of the plays that they like to do, but one of their playbooks is flood the market with a given commodity that you want to control. They did it with rare earths. I think they did it with graphite. You know, so if they're all of a sudden flooding the market, let's say with lithium, and it doesn't give us the specific metals that they're increasing the supply here, but for example, if China is all of a sudden giving a lot of lithium to the market, I think that has to be a bit of a red flag. And there's Indonesia. One thinks about nickel in that regard. And Democratic Republic of Congo, maybe lithium and copper. So let's continue here. And we have a quote from Colin Hamilton, Managing Director for Commodities Research at BMO Capital Markets. Quote, there's certainly enough supply of all at present, end quote. And it continues, prices for the battery metals, quote, were too high to be sustainable, end quote once output expanded more quickly than expected. EV sales are rising, but higher interest rates and uncertain economic conditions in major economies are damping consumer demand. In China, the biggest market, there's been a slowdown in year-on-year -year growth. And let's just continue a little further here. A, quote, huge build-out, end quote, in Chinese battery capacity, and we know that they want to run the battery market don't we? I mean, that should be as clear as day. So again, taking the rare earth example where they flooded the market and then the, I think it was the Mountain Pass mine that Molly Corp eventually tried to reopen unsuccessfully. Remember, like the Chinese were able to get that entire, almost like a, a stranglehold on that market. And now one wonders, is it the same playbook here with batteries? So let's just take a look at this paragraph here. A, quote, huge build-out, end quote, in Chinese battery capacity, aided by government policies, means supply outweighs demand by two to one. ANZ Group Holdings analyst Daniel Hines and Sony Kumari said in a note last week, this has seen battery makers cut output and reduce their inventories, they said, adding that lithium, nickel, and cobalt prices are likely to remain depressed in the short term. And as we were saying here, the lower metal prices are providing some cost relief to automakers and battery producers and could lead to cheaper EVs for consumers. BYD, China's biggest EV manufacturer and contemporary Amperex technology, that's cattle, I think, the country's top battery producer, have both benefited from lower lithium costs this year. And we have a quote from Li Jiawei, an analyst at trading company Jamen Zhengyu New Energy, who said at a conference last month, quote, Lithium prices will continue to face downward pressure in 2024 and 2025 as the release of new supply sources outpace demand, end quote. And finally, from this really interesting article, Bloomberg News via Mining.com, there are still upside risks for battery metals, however. The probability is rising that Indonesia, which produces more than half the world's nickel, could take policy steps to boost prices, Citigroup said in a note last month. China, meanwhile, is planning to boost its strategic stockpiles of cobalt, which is also important in the defense and aerospace industries. Again, one wonders if the same thing is taking place in North America and Europe. Surely, we are taking advantage of the low prices, one hopes. Continuing on, in the longer term, the question is whether the current cycle of lower prices sees companies canceling or delaying plans for new mines or refineries for the coming decade. 
absent policy support from governments aiming to build out their own supply chains. Albemarle, the world's largest lithium producer, says this is already starting to happen. So now development of mines is starting to reduce because of low prices in the short term. But as we all know, a mine takes about 8 to 10 years to get into production, sometimes longer. So I kind of always come back to this inherent advantage that China has by making these long-term, basically government investments. And I completely understand when people are saying, we don't want the government involved, it's just going to mess up everything. But we have to come to terms, I would argue, with this short-termism. You know, just buying the cycle. You know, buying high, selling low is what everybody's trying to do. And meanwhile, just my perspective here, but I'm not seeing it help us in terms of building out new mines. So just more for us to ponder here. Again, we have a great show, a Precious Metal Summit preview in Zurich, as well as a wonderful interview by Alicia Hyatt with Frank Justra on his view on macroeconomics, geopolitics, and all the big questions facing us as we move forward towards 2024. And with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host this podcast and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to Precious Metals Summit Conference's CEO, Jessica Leventhal, and Northern Miner Group President, Anthony Vaccaro, for a preview of the upcoming Precious Metals Summit in Zurich on November 13th to 15th. Joining us today, I am very pleased to welcome Jessica Leventhal, CEO of Precious Metals Summit Conferences, and Anthony Vaccaro, president of the Northern Miner Group, to the Northern Miner Podcast. Jessica and Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks. Nice to be here with you today, Adrian. Thanks so much, Adrian. It's always a pleasure to join you on the podcast. Well, likewise, it's great to have you both here. So tell us, uh, Jessica, I mean, as CEO of the Precious Metals Summit Conferences, you have a big conference coming up in Zurich in November. Tell us what you're up to with this event that's happening. Of course, people have heard of Beaver Creek. What's going on in Zurich? Zurich, we're doing a conference that runs from November 13th to 15th, two and a half days. It's actually our 11th year doing a Precious Metal Summit conference in Zurich because we launched there in 2013. So we have some roots and some really good connections in Zurich, Switzerland, which is a financial hub for investing in junior miners. And this year, what is new is that we expanded the event to include an additional half day on the energy transition companies because we've had a lot of interest, as you can imagine, in the past year and even prior to that from companies that were not, strictly speaking, precious metals related. And uh, this year we decided with conditions the way they are and so much global interest in the energy transition and the, you know, the positioning that's taking place in critical and strategic metals, it made a lot of sense to offer a half-day session devoted to these metals, such as lithium and nickel and copper and even uranium. We have a number of uranium companies presenting. So we're running two simultaneous tracks the morning of the 15th, and we're very pleased to be partnering with Northern Miners Symposium and Anthony, who are hosting the Energy Transition Day in collaboration with Precious Metal Summit. Anthony will be kicking off the morning on the 15th of November with a great panel discussion called Positioning for the Global Energy Transition. And then he'll be closing out the morning with a lunch panel on trends and opportunities in battery metals featuring two speakers, one of whom is a specialist in global lithium markets and the other is an expert in the global nickel market and nickel mining. And we're having a lot of interest expressed in it, and we're pleased to present just about 100 companies over the two and a half days, most of whom are making presentations, and all of whom who are there to do one-on-one -on -one meetings with our invited investors, portfolio managers, and financiers, who are mainly European-based, and a lot of them are resident in the Zurich area of Switzerland. Well, it sounds like a very full schedule, and it is fascinating. Put it this way, I could imagine how there would be an overlap. I mean, usually 
it's not a huge leap to go from precious metals to say copper as an investor. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Like, is this the first time you've ever done this? No. To call it an energy transition day or half day and devote a whole half a day of the program to energy transition, yes. But a few years back, maybe 2018 or 2019, we did offer in Zurich a battery metals session within our two-day conference. And it was at the time when battery metals were getting a lot of coverage about four or five years ago. And we do find that in Zurich, actually, as compared to Beaver Creek, our European investors are more, let's say, agnostic as to the type of metals. And while there is a lot of interest in gold and silver, they're also keenly following the uranium space and other metals as well. Whereas in Beaver Creek, the original conference we launched in 2011, that was really targeted to be a precious metals focused event from the get-go. And our advisory board is comprised of gold fund managers with a specialty niche. So we try to carve out Beaver Creek as being pretty much precious metals. So it isn't the first time we've offered something like this in Zurich. And there have been non-precious metals all along participating in our Zurich show, but not featured. Yeah, no, that is super interesting. And so turning to Anthony then, tell us then, you're going to do, it sounds like a half day, if I'm not mistaken here, on the energy transition in Zurich. So what do you have planned? Right, thanks, Adrian. Uh, Well, we're going to have two really powerful panel sessions. We're going to kick off the morning, as Jessica mentioned. We're going to be looking at how to best position for the global energy transition tackling the big themes of the day. We'll get from the panelists their opinions on what critical minerals I think will outperform, what are the supply demand fundamentals that will be driving that, how government policy factors in, how environmental factors are factoring in. And we have a nice range of panelists here. We have John Fennick, who many people will know from his appearances on Kitco. He's president of Fennick Consulting as a market expert. Johnny Kovacevic, Uh, built up Copper Bank and is now director of Lithium Bank, so an expert on both copper and on lithium. Scott Melby is one of the gurus of the uranium space. We're definitely going to be talking about uranium and its role in the energy transition. And we also have Jamie Strauss, who is one of the foremost experts on ESG, can talk a lot about where the industry is going and needs to go on that front. And then we'll hear from a lot of the up and coming and interesting companies. We'll get some great corporate presentations from companies that are actually busy exploring and developing the future supply that we all know is so critical if we're going to make this energy transition what it needs to be. And then we're going to wrap up in the afternoon with a nice conversation, as Jessica said, with Mark Selby. He's CEO of Canada Nickel, and he's just a complete nickel expert, been in the nickel space. My goodness, since the back in the days when I was a reporter at the Northern Miner in 2005, (laughs) and he was there before that, but I remember meeting Mark back when I started. And we also have Andy Leyland, which is going to be really nice. Long admired Andy's work. He's formerly of Benchmark Minerals. He's now managing director of SC, as in supply chain, SC Insights. And he's a, one of the top experts on battery metals, looking at it from a fundamental perspective. So really good content. Really excited about it. Been a big fan of what Precious Metals Summit team has been doing over the years. I was lucky enough and honored to be invited to the very first Precious Metal Summit back in Beaver Creek. And goodness, Jessica, was that 2010? When was the very first one? It was September 2011. 2011. You know, when I went to that first one, it was very clear to everyone there that you were really onto something. And sure enough, Precious Metal Summit, Beaver Creek, and Zurich as well have become the uh, the go-to event in precious metals. And now we're seeing it with uh, all that expertise and that ability to bring the right people together. It's nice to see it grow in to the energy transition side of things as well. So very excited. Jessica's had me there as a moderator in the past. Northern Miner has provided coverage over the years, and it's nice to make a a more full-fledged contribution to the event in Zurich coming up in a couple weeks. Anthony, I want to also acknowledge like your support and your coverage of that first event in 2011 was really meaningful for us and really helped grow the brand, you know, by spreading the word about it. And we are really you know, so happy to have collaborated with you over the years. And it's been a very joyful collaboration working with you and the Northern Miner team over the years, which sort of makes me want to segue into what's coming up in April when we collaborate and partner on a brand new event called the Energy Transition Metals Summit, 
which we are co-producing. Go ahead. Tell us about this. As I was just, you know, thinking to myself, like this energy transition is at the heart, you know, the center of really so much of what is going on in politically, uh, globally right now. So you guys are going to, is it Washington, D.C.? Anthony, do you want to start us off? Like, what are you planning in Washington? Well, I'm, I'm not, you set that up perfectly, Adrian. And to the audience, there was, uh, there was no pre-interview on this at all. It's just Adrian's good instincts. Yeah, I mean, talking about the energy transition being at the center and that political angle, the politics being so important. And it was Jessica's idea to do it in Washington, D.C., which was a stroke of brilliance. We knew we wanted to do something together around energy transition, critical minerals. We know that it is going to be the defining theme of the next 10 to 20 years. So how do these two great brands work together to bring people together and to bring the right insights in the content? It was a natural fit for us to work together. And when Jessica came, we were bouncing around ideas and Jessica said, Washington, D.C. Everyone, the light bulb went <laughs> off. We're like, yes, it's Washington, D.C. Where else could be a better spot to bring government leaders together, the OEMs, which are increasingly such a critical part of this entire process, as well as investors. And of course, the issuers, the ones that are actually getting the metal on the ground. So we think it's the perfect venue. And I'm pretty confident that this is going to become the leading platform for energy transition conferences going forward. It's a brilliant idea. Jessica, did you want to add to what's happening in Washington? I'll just add that, you know, we've got two days. We're just starting to roll out inviting companies, but currently have 33 or so firmed up. And we hope to have a roster of 80 to 90 companies appearing over the two days. And Northern Miner is putting together thought leadership speakers and panels. And I just also want to uh, mention, um, yes, although I came up with the, I guess I said the words Washington, D.C., I have to confess to you that I have uh, some people behind me also who have suggested <laughs> that. City. So it wasn't entirely my idea. We do think it's a very good idea because we're close to the policy there and we're close to a lot of people who pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the critical metals policy world. In a sense, once someone says it, it's obvious. But until then, it, it's actually not obvious at all to, to put it there. So a brilliant idea. Does anybody have any final thoughts? Anthony or Jessica, any final thoughts on the shows? I would just say stay tuned. Uh, the DC show we will be announcing in the coming, while well, leading up into Zurich, we'll be announcing some pretty fantastic speakers uh, for the main stage. So stay tuned for that. And maybe Adrian, you'll be good enough to have us back on after we do some good work in Zurich and we can go a little bit deeper into what we're going to be up to in Washington at that time. It would be a pleasure. This sounds all very interesting and very exciting. When exactly then is this conference then in Washington? So it will be on April 29th and 30th of next year, of 2024. They can go to either one of our websites. If they go to preciousummit.com, then they will find a box that will give them more information. And likewise, you can go to the northernminer.com and go to the events section. And we have more information there as well. Jessica Leventhal, CEO of Precious Metals Summit conferences and Anthony Vaccaro, president of the Northern Miner Group. Thank you for joining us on the Northern Miner podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us, Adrian. It's been a pleasure. And turning to the website, we have this very complex story of First Quantum. Their shares took a 50% hit here about a week ago. October 27th, they're trading about $28. And then by November 1st, they were down to 15 so almost cut in half here. And now they're currently trading at $16.99 on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Here is the headline from November 1st. This is Cecilia Jamazmi at mining.com. First quantum shares down 50% as Panama Congress Committee OK's referendum. Panama's president, Laurentino Cortizo, has cleared the first hurdle to fast track a bill that would allow the country to hold a referendum on the controversial 20-year contract with Canadian miner First Quantum Minerals. After 10 months of negotiation between the parties, the country inked in October a multi-billion dollar deal with the miner, letting it operate its flagship Cobre Panama Copper Mine for the next 20 years. So again, this is after 10 months of negotiation. The decision, which ended years of legal uncertainty, was signed into a law last week triggering a series of violent protests across Panama City, the capital. 
So, I mean, I was discussing this with Don Lindsay in the discussion we featured last week, this emotional attachment that populations have, that countries have, that peoples have with the resources in the ground. And I mean, you see it here. It's almost like it's seen as like the personal wealth. And in a sense, it is, right? Of the people of the country. Shares in the company have fallen a shocking 50% this week as uncertainty over the future of its key asset prompts investors to reduce their exposure. Protesters claim the new contract was fast-tracked with little public input or transparency. I don't know if I'd consider 10 months a fast-tracking. As far as transparency and public input, I know nothing. But just looking at the data, I mean, 10 months, is that a fast-tracking? And it sounds like it's been going on for years, I might add. They have also made corruption allegations against lawmakers. In response, Cortizo announced the country would hold a referendum on whether to revoke the controversial contract on December 17th. The president's move was stopped in its tracks, with Panama's electoral court saying it was unable to hold a nationwide vote on the issue because that would require Congress to first pass a law. How confusing is this? A legislative committee approved the bill late on Tuesday, clearing the first hurdle for the proposal to become a law. Bill 1110 revokes the controversial Law 406, and I believe Law 406 was the signing of the contract, so to speak, and also bans the granting of future mining concessions in Panama. Wow. The bill has now been sent to the plenary for general debate, where it will require a majority vote in two separate sessions for definitive approval. In the first of the two sessions, lawmakers approved by a 63-0 vote a provision to rescind the contract for the Cobre Panama mine. If that repeal bill is approved on Thursday, the proposed referendum on the contract would be unnecessary. And I have another article here. It's also by Cecilia Jamazmi from November 3rd. Lawmakers on Thursday passed a revised bill that blocks all future mining concessions, including exploration, extraction, and transportation of minerals, as well as contract renewals in the Central American country. The provision to revoke First Quantum's contract was eliminated, and the National Assembly referred the agreement enshrined in Law 406 to the country's Supreme Court for a ruling. Interestingly, the mine is continuing production. And we have a statement from First Quantum, who said the mine has not stopped production. Quote, however, like many businesses across Panama, protests, including blockades of key roads, have caused disruptions on sites as well as shortages in certain supplies. End quote. BMO Capital Markets said the country would be unlikely to pass a new mining code before a national election next May if the court ruled Law 406 is unconstitutional. And we have a quote from BMO mining analyst Jackie Prisbolowski. Quote, we do not expect that either First Quantum or the government intends to disrupt mining operations as it likely didn't intend to cause temporary mine closure in February, especially into an election when Panama is already facing drought-related disruptions to canal operations. Interesting. You know, water is one of these issues that really doesn't get discussed enough when we consider how central it is to this industry. And Prisbolowski continues, quote, We expect the mine will continue to operate through this period of uncertainty. Revisions to the mining code in 2024 will not be so severe as to justify or force closure. We do see risk to temporary disruptions from protest activities at the port. First Quantum is Canada's largest copper producer, and its Cobre Panama mine in production since 2019 contributes almost 5% of the country's GDP. I assume they mean Panama. It also makes up 75% of Panama's exports of goods and has created at least 40,000 jobs directly and indirectly. 40,000 jobs. So a lot on the line in Panama. Continuing on, Northern Graphite resumes processing at North America's only producing mine. So, of course, China recently has announced the restriction of exports of graphite, with synthetic graphite being the big pressure point. And let's just take a look here. Cecilia Jamazmi again on Northern Miner. Northern Graphite has resumed processing ore at Lac des Îles Mine in Quebec, North America's only producing mine of the commodity the company said on Friday. The decision follows rising market demand after China curbed graphite exports last month. Some types of natural and man-made forms of graphite will require permits from December 1st, 
the world's top graphite producer said. You wonder if they sped up the schedule a little bit here because of this China restriction. Graphite is used in anodes or negatively charged portion of electric vehicle batteries. And we have a quote from CEO Hugues Jacquemin, who said in a statement, quote, what we saw starting in the third quarter was that customers were really coming off the sidelines to secure supply for the year after a hiatus in the first half. The company has immediate capacity available to supply the market, Jacquemin said. Northern Graphite also has the ability to scale quickly thanks to its Okanjande mine in Namibia. Now, it brings up the whole issue of refining, though. Because again, the synthetic graphite, it seems to me that that would be a product of refinement. And the real stranglehold, from my understanding, with a lot of these critical metals in China is on the refining side of things. It's not necessarily the actual commodity. It's the production of the commodity once it's put through all these processes. I mean, the question remains that I would have for, say, Hugues Jacquemin or whomever else is involved in this Is the graphite still going to China to get refined? That's kind of the unasked question here. Continuing on, Saudis in talks with Pakistan, Enrico Deek, Barrick's CEO says, this is Bloomberg News via mining.com, Saudi Arabia is in ongoing talks with Pakistan to buy part of the government's stake in a $7 billion copper project jointly owned with Barrick Gold, according to the head of the mining company. Saudi Arabia may acquire partial ownership in Rico Deek, one of the world's largest undeveloped copper and gold deposits, through an equity purchase with Pakistan's government, Barrick Chief Executive Officer Mark Brissot said in an interview. And here's a quote from Brissot. That's something that is in the hands of the Pakistan government to come to a decision on. We would support any decision that's made by the Pakistan government with the Saudis. End quote. The project in the Balochistan region bordering Afghanistan and Iran is capable of producing 200,000 tons of copper and 250,000 ounces of gold a year for more than half a century. Massive project here. Rico Deek is 50% owned by Barrick, with Pakistan's federal government holding a 25% stake and the Balochistan regional government owning the rest. Brissot said Barrick won't dilute its equity in the project, and it sounds like they want to start this thing in 2028. So, interesting developments there. Barrick also investing in an exploration company, adding to their stake. This is Colin McClelland at northernminer.com. Barrick Gold is investing in junior Hercules Silver as part of a plan to find porphyry copper deposits, Barrick CEO Mark Brissot says. Of particular interest was Hercules, reporting 185 meters grading 0.84% copper at its self-named project in Idaho, Bristow said in a phone call to the Northern Miner on Monday. So Bristow has been talking about his interest in copper for a couple of years here at least, and he is making good on those comments. And here's a quote from Bristow. That makes sense for Barrick to invest in what appears to be a possible new discovery. It's certainly a confirmation that it's a geological opportunity opening up. And that's what Barrick is all about, investing in early stage value creating discoveries. And here is Brissot on copper. We've grown our copper exposure. What we're interested in is investing in tier one assets in both gold and copper and porphyry generally comes with both gold and copper. So investing a little bit in Idaho, continuing on. HSBC takes stab at using blockchain to modernize London's antiquated gold market. And there is a real need for this. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. One of the world's top bullion banks is bringing blockchain to the antiquated London gold market. HSBC Holdings has launched a platform that uses distributed ledger technology to tokenize ownership of physical gold held in its London vault. Mark Williamson, Global Head of Effects and Commodities Partnerships and Propositions, said in an interview, The new system creates digital tokens that represent gold bars, which can then be traded through the bank's single-dealer platform. HSBC isn't the first attempt using blockchain to simplify gold investing. Crypto startup Paxos, I am actually, uh, I use this, full disclosure. That is how I invest in gold here. And my issue with Paxos, just on a personal note, is it doesn't seem to track the gold price beautifully. Like sometimes it's up the gold price and then you see your crypto doesn't seem to be exactly matching it. I would prefer something that's a little more 
closer to whatever I'm seeing on CNBC. I'm not sure if that's possible, but that would be nice. Crypto startup Paxos in 2016 teamed up with Euroclear to build a blockchain-based settlement service for trades on the London bullion market. But the firms dissolved the partnership the following year. Paxos still offers a digital token backed by physical gold called Pax Gold, which has a total market value of $479 million, according to CoinGecko. I mean, this is the thing. It's even easier than a stock account. You know, that's part of the appeal of crypto, by the way. It's actually easier to set up than a stock account. I mean, that's changing with services like Robinhood and Scalable and all these, you know, trading platforms that you find apps for. But crypto is pretty easy to set up. And so there is a kind of a, I would argue there is a need for something like this and different players too, in order to, you know, create some competition in that market. Exactly as Mark Williamson says here, this is it. Using blockchain technology makes the process, quote, quicker and less cumbersome, end quote, as clients can more easily track the gold they own through the platform down to the serial number of each bar, Williams had said. HSBC plans to eventually expand its system to include other precious metals. So watch this space. So those are your news stories. Now, let's take a look at metal prices. And turning to metal prices, let's take a quick look at the bond market for context here. The U.S. 10-year bond is at 4.627%. So let's call it 4.63%. That is down 0.2% from last week. So big move lower in bonds in terms of yield. Italy, it was a very similar move down 0.17 at 4.54% on the 10-year bond there. And the U.K. 10-year gilt is also down 0.19 at 4.31%. So a little bit of a respite from the climbing yields in the last couple of weeks here in the bond market. So things calming down a little bit, perhaps gaining a little bit of fuel for their next move. Let's see. Turning to the metals market, gold is trading at $1,970.40 per ounce. That is $36 lower. Then last week, silver is trading at $22.64 per ounce. That is 69 cents lower than last week. I mean, when you consider gold is at $2,000, I mean, the gold to silver ratio, I imagine you're paying more silver to get an ounce of gold right now at only $22.64. Very interesting. Continuing on, platinum is at $907.36 per ounce. That is $25 lower than last week, and palladium is $25 lower at $1,100.26 per ounce. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is $0.05 cents higher at $3.70 per pound. Iron ore is also higher at $126.63 per metric ton. That is $8 higher than last week. Aluminum is a penny higher at $1.04 per pound. Lead is also a penny higher at $0.99 cents per pound. Nickel continues to fall at $8.16 per pound. That is $0.07 cents lower than last week. Don't forget, we had $21 nickel right after the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. $21 I have here. Now it is at $8.16 per pound. Tin is $0.25 cents lower at $11.05 per pound. Cobalt is unchanged at $15.16 per pound. Lithium is also unchanged at $22.35 per kilogram. Uranium is a dollar higher at $74 per pound. So continuing its relentless climb here after a little break. And zinc also higher at $1.16 per pound. That is four cents higher than last week. What do we see? Precious metals take a break. I mean, silver looking pretty shiny there at $22.64, not financial advice, of course. And industrial metals look, you know, basically a mixed bag, you know, not too much movement, except for nickel, which is quite noteworthy in its continued move down. 
lithium kind of remaining at $22. I mean, when I first started tracking this, maybe six months ago, it was at 51. So remember how we opened this show? The shine is coming off a lot of these critical battery metals. So very interesting there. And of course, uranium is also a bit of a head turner here as it continues its climb after a little break in consolidation about a month ago. So now it's $74 per pound. And finally, zinc is also noteworthy. It continues to climb $1.16 per pound. So to me, this is a market of individual metals right now, and it always has been, but it seems a little bit more this week. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have Canadian mining entrepreneur and philanthropist Frank Joustra at the Canadian Mining Symposium in London, and he is interviewed by Alicia Hyatt, editor-in-chief of the Northern Miner. A very fascinating discussion on geopolitics, dollar hegemony, BRICS, and all these great topics that we are able to tackle here in the natural resources discussion. So a fascinating interview with Frank Justra. I hope you enjoy it, and I will see you on the other side. start off the conversation by talking about geopolitics and macroeconomics because there are huge shifts taking place right now that um, everyone is trying to make sense of. And you've spent a, a lot of time and energy studying this and writing about it. So I just wanted to know what got you interested in this topic initially? Mainly because I was a uh, student of history. I love reading about history, both um, ge geopolitical history and economic history. Just a subject that fascinates me, has for well over 20 years. And um, I'm always of the belief that if you understand history, you understand what's happening, somewhat what's happening today. There are certainly a lot of patterns that tend to repeat themselves over and over throughout the centuries. And I think we're going through a very transitional period at the moment that I, that I think investors have to be absolutely concerned with and knowledgeable about. And I think if you're not, as an investor, if you're not watching the shifting political geopolitical landscape, if you're not watching the macroeconomic events that are taking place, um, you're really, it's like trying to navigate your way out of the eye of a hurricane because you don't, there's so much going on. We're living in unprecedented times and you have to look at things like um, the rise of the BRICS, China and the BRICS and what their ambitions are geopolitically and economically. You have to look at what's happening with the dysfunction of the political system in the United States. You have to look at central bank behavior and the mismanagement of, of fiat currencies. You have to look at all of these things. Uh, the rise, you know, the, what's happening in the Middle East. Incredible shifts taking place in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia and Iran now normalizing relations with now this new Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is going to possibly draw Israel and the U.S. into some sort of conflict with Iran because uh, there's a lot of finger pointing taking place. So it's, you, you have to have a knowledge of what's going on because asset classes will behave differently under different circumstances. You know, whether it's a stock, a bond, a commodity, real estate, they all have different behavioral patterns depending what's going on at a macro level. So let's start with a couple of things that you mentioned. We're in a officially, I think now, period of deglobalization and moving into a multipolar world instead of a unipolar world dominated by the United States uh, fiscal and military might. So in this uh, situation, the status of the U.S. dollar as the world's unquestioned reserve currency is being challenged. How likely do you think the dollar is to be usurped from its current role? I think there's no doubt that eventually it will. I don't think there's any doubt in that for a whole host of reasons which I can get into. The timing and how it actually unfolds that's who knows i mean it could <laughs> so many ways this can go but you have to look at what's happening with the mechanisms by which the rest of the world is trying to get out of the u.s dollar system and there's all sorts of conversations taking place and i don't know which way it's going to go but i can give you a whole laundry list of possibilities so there's the possibility of a BRICS currency a BRICS plus currency as you know, BRICS has now six new members. I think another 17 or 19 applicants wanting to join. 
it really becoming an organization. A lot of people don't know, but BRICS have many, many subcommittees that meet about 160 times a year. It's like this is a real coalition that's coming together. So it could be a BRICS back currency, it could be a BRICS back currency with gold, it could be a yuan, gold back yuan, which is entirely possible. And I have my own theories about what China is doing with respect to its gold purchases. It could be a central bank digital currency which is only used for cross-border trade between countries. And I don't know if you've heard of the M-Bridge project, which is China, Thailand, and the UAE, but they've been testing this for well over a year now to test the use of a central bank digital currency for settlement purposes, which is entirely outside of the U.S. dollar system. It could be a digital central bank digital currency backed by gold or commodities. That's another conversation that's been taking place. And also what is actually taking place as we speak and you see a new one announced every day are these bilateral trade agreements using only local currencies. Whether it's France and China or Brazil and Argentina and China, or whether it's South Korea and Indonesia or Malaysia and, and India, they're all establishing these mechanisms by which they can trade between each other using their local currencies. And you've got African nations and South American nations urging everyone to use local currencies for trade and dumping the U.S. dollar. And the entire reason is to get out of the system where the U.S. dollar is the middleman in transactions between countries. So that's going to happen regardless. So it's a question of how long is it going to take? So if it's a slow chipping away at the value of the U.S. dollar, it could take 5, 10, 15, 20 years. If the BRICS nations decide they want to set up a new currency for trade and settlement purposes only, not to be confused with a reserve currency. Okay, this is, and people get very confused about how that's going to work, but we're talking about mechanisms by which you settle trading. And so all of these things are taking place. And if the introduction of a BRICS currency or the yuan is introduced as a gold backed currency, for instance, then you will see a more rapid devaluation of the US dollar against other currencies. So it's going to happen. What the U.S. does about it, well, <laughs> that's a whole other issue. And I've been saying for a long time now, and for a long time, no one was taking it seriously, that this would be very detrimental to U.S. national security. The U.S. has had the supreme currency now since the end of World War II. It has given a tremendous advantage to run up huge deficits, use an overvalued dollar to buy assets worldwide, it's kept interest rates low, inflation low, and standard of living high. And if you take away that privilege, especially now with the fiscal situation that's, that's, that's happening with the U.S. debt, it would, I think, be a, a devastating blow. I am one that believes that you're going to get a reaction. And you're already seeing the beginnings of a reaction to all this conversation about getting de-dollarization. And the U.S., you can just tell, by the way, the U.S. media is now finally waking up to the fact that this conversation is real. And so they're in, one, in the same breath, they're warning and dismissing the idea. And I've, <laughs> I can give you a whole bunch of uh, things that I've read lately, which are, just shows you either how naive some of these journalists are or how complicit they are in trying to poo-poo something that is happening. And so the war of the narrative has begun. That's on the communication side, but then on the countering China, because it's China that's actually creating this movement, convincing countries to de-dollarize. Obviously, Russia is doing it also, but China has more economic power, and it's, 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 it's attracting a lot of dance partners. So the reaction is, as I've said, what's the U.S. going to do? They'll use sticks and carrots to either cajole, to cajole nations from not de-dollarizing and they'll, so the, what are, the, what are the, uh, the sticks? The sticks are, well, well ex as they threatened Turkey and the UAE when they weren't playing uh, along with the sanctions against Russia, they said, well, we'll exclude you from G7 markets. With other countries, they'll, they'll say, well, it's, say Saudi Arabia, we'll take away your, your security guarantees. So that's the sticks. Then the carrots are quite amusing because they've only happened very recently. And it's an answer to China's rise and China's creation uh, of the BRICS New Development Bank, which is competing with the World Bank. It has about $600 billion available to do what the World Bank does. China has currency swap arrangements with 40 countries. The U.S. has five. And this allows for, you know, during liquidity events to provide currency on currency swaps. 
It's got a um, something called a contingent reserve arrangement, which is also a an arrangement to act like the IMF. And it's obviously got the Belt and Road Initiative. And so what's the U.S. doing? They're urging to put more money to the World Bank to be more lenient towards infrastructure build-outs in, in the developing world. They've announced their own Belt and Road Initiative from India through the Middle East into Europe. And then they just recently announced one in, the, in Africa that they're going to help fund with this infrastructure fund between Angola, the DRC, and Zambia. And so they're doing all of these things to try, and they're competing. But they're, this is a competition between the U.S. and China. And I'm seeing that most of the world, when you look at the Global South or the BRICS nations, they only look to their own self-interest. They don't have really any ideological beliefs, whether it's about the Russia invasion of Ukraine or what have you. They just want to get out of the, under the foot of this U.S. dollar system because it's costing them a lot of money. You know, this, you know, the cost to service a sovereign debt that's denominating U.S. dollars is very expensive, especially with rates going through the roof now. You know, the U.S. is exporting its inflation to these other countries because commodities are all priced in U.S. dollars. So, so you've got 80% of the world that's going, you know what? We wouldn't mind a change. And this is what's happening. And the U.S. is going to have, you know, it's going to have a challenging time to try and, and, and prevent this from happening. I don't think in the long run they can stop. I think they will try and get in the way of it. You know, they, they had a conversation with India just before that uh, summit in South Africa between the BRICS. And then India came and said, oh, we don't want a BRICS currency. You know, so there was a conversation that took place there. So I, I think you're going to see a very, it's going to be very chaotic. And it might not settle out for a decade or two, or it could happen in the next five years, but it's happening. What are the implications for commodities and for gold? Well, commodities, you know, okay, so you have to separate commodity, gold is a commodity, but there's traditional commodities, and then you have gold, which is a monetary asset also. With commodities, there's also a rush by China to create relationships to secure commodities for the long term. And you've seen it with respect to China and Iran with their comprehensive strategic uh, partnership. You've seen it with respect to China and Saudi Arabia and the GCC countries with their all-encompassing energy co cooperation agreement. You've seen it with the special friendship between Russia and China, all these things that they, they, they label. And what China is doing is securing its long-term commodity needs by having these arrangements. So I think you're going to see a world where there's going to be a lot of competition for supplies of commodities, oil, metals, food. And, you know, with the Russia war, with the Ukraine, a lot of that stuff comes from there. <laughs> so that's going to be problematic to begin with. But I think it's also going to be that China will try and secure its own relationships to secure long-term contracts and provide an exchange of, um, instead of what the U.S. has done for years, which is oil for arms, <clears throat> especially with respect to the Middle East, now it's oil for development. So China wants oil, and it's buying huge amounts from countries that are sanctioned by the U.S., Venezuela, Russia, Iran, and it's getting it at a discount, and it's securing long-term contracts, and in turn, to deaccumulate the yuans that go for, because they want that oil paid for in yuans, they're investing in infrastructure and other exports of t technology and other equipment to those countries to keep a balance. And so I think the U.S. is suddenly waking up to that fact also. I know I've personally have had calls from U.S. representatives urging people like myself and others that can raise lots of money to develop projects to come and look, take a much closer look at Africa. And I've got my own reasons why I would or wouldn't do that. But I can see I've, I've been approached twice, two different parts, and I can see what they're trying to do now. And they're trying to encourage Western investors to secure these, the development of these projects worldwide in South America and in Africa and other places. And so there's going to be a battle. And I think what that means is commodity prices will go up. With respect to gold, I think that, <laughs> I think we're going to see a reset in the global monetary system. That's absolutely going to happen. Again, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I have a sneaking suspicion that gold's going to play a role. Why else? would, for the last 13 years, central banks around the world, the non-West central banks, have been accumulating gold and now at an accelerating pace. They're de-dollarizing and they're buying gold. And, you know, last year broke a record 
we're back on. I just saw the numbers from the Rural Gold Council this morning. It looks like August and September, they're back at it again. You know, and they all take turns. You know, the, recently it was it's India and Poland, you know. Last month it was Singapore and Egypt. And, you know, but they're all slowly, slowly de-dollarizing and accumulating gold. And there has to be a purpose to it. Secondly, I believe that China has a lot more gold than it's declared. A lot more. And the reason I believe that is just by looking at the numbers. They're the world's largest gold producer. They're the world's largest gold importer. They don't allow the export of buying gold outside of China. 46,000 tons of physical gold has moved from the west to the east since 1995. And China's had a habit of reporting for a number of years, then they stop reporting. And then when they report again, they got a lot more gold. And they just recently, just last year, started reporting again. And, and my guess is there's a lot of gold stuffed in a lot of Chinese institutions, government institutions. And when there's a need to declare their true gold holdings, they will. And my guess is that there's a lot of conversation taking place about either a gold-backed currency or a commodity and gold-backed currencies. I don't buy the commodity idea because commodity is too, be too awkward and I don't know how you would back a currency with commodities. There are, for instance, 70 different grades of oil out there. This oil is not fungible, it's not all the same. And so my guess is gold is already a tier one monetary asset with all sorts of central banks. Why not gold? And, you know, the argument will be, well, you know, there's not enough gold. You know, you, you can't do it in today's monetary system, not enough gold. Well, <laughs> then you don't know history because gold, if you have enough of it, and you are in a control position of owning more gold than anybody else, then you can revalue gold, basically devalue your currency, and revalue gold to a different price if you control the pricing, and create more credit and reserves. And that's been discussed even by European countries lately. But I, I suspect that, you know, the U.S. has 8,100 tons of gold. Europe collectively has more gold than the U.S. The BRICS plus that are about 7,000 tons now. And they keep buying it. And there are more applicants wanting to come into the BRICS countries. And my belief that China has more gold than it's declaring. So I think at some point they will use gold much like and to reprice gold once you have control of the pricing. The U.S. did it in 1933. First, they confiscated everybody's gold. And then the minute they confiscated it all, they repriced it by 65%, in effectively screwing their own people. Did it again in 1971. You know, when you know, Charles de Gaulle and all these others were trying to take their gold, exchange their dollars for gold, you know, Nixon closes the window and goes, you thought your gold was there, all of a sudden smoke is gone. And so I think that at some point, when the pricing control moves from west to east, when the Shanghai Gold Exchange finally has control of pricing, and it will happen, then that's when you'll see maybe gold playing a role. Speak specifically about the mining sector. What are the opportunities and risks that you see in this changing environment? I mean, we've heard that um, it's difficult to get financing, mm. um, especially on the junior side. But um, do you have any advice for companies either on the junior side or on the producing side? Oh, maybe like Tony Morrow, maybe look to heaven and, and pray because uh, that's it, it is very hard for for junior mining companies. And I, and I listen, and, and I feel badly for the junior miners that can't raise capital because the sentiment is simply not there. The market doesn't care about this sector at the moment. That will change, but at the moment it's tough. You know, got a friend of mine here. We've been doing this for you know 40, 45 years. And I've seen lots of bull markets, lots of bear markets, and lots of quiet time. And, you know, that's sentiment. And then things change. And they change. And then all of a sudden, it might, might happen gradually or suddenly. You're going to get the, the floodgates open up, and there, there will be an interest. But to me, there's so much value in the marketplace with gold miners and developers, certain developers. And I can speak to exploration separately. But certainly for developers and miners, there's so much value out there right now. And that there's zero sentiments by generalist investors. They just don't care. In the West here, you know, we're focused on other things, you know, tech stocks, crypto, and whatever. It's in the East that people are buying the gold, you know, and investing in gold mines. You've got China running around the world buying up gold mines like crazy. And, uh, and I think we're, you know, we here in the West have been asleep at the switch here, and, and that's going to have to change. Um, my guess it'll only change when gold reaches a new level and stays there, you know, a, high, a new high and stays there. And then, you know, 
then I think we'll get uh, we'll get some action. But at, at, at right now, it's tough out there. Now, the flip side is if you are a buyer, <laughs> if you're someone that has access to capital and likes the sector, I've never, I've never seen an opportunity like this. I mean, I, you know, it's like being a kid in a candy store. You can go out there and just pick off incredible value, and all you have to do is be patient because it's there. I can name it several companies. I won't, but I can name several companies that where I, you know, I see their free cash flow and their the profit margins and, you know, the multiples to their cash flows. I'm going, this is nuts. This is crazy. I mean, and their the life of their minds, you know, and the grades and you go, you know, there's incredible value there, but nobody cares, but that will change. So you recently started to invest in exploration, I think for not the first time, but maybe First time in a very, very long time. <laughs> so you put some money into Black Wolf Copper and Gold, which has projects in Alaska. What prompted you to change your mind about exploration? You know, I've had a formula that's worked for me to build gold mining companies. I've, you know, I'm on my fifth one right now in the last 22, 23 years. Um, Sorry, that's Eris Mining. No, it's West. Eris is fourth. fourth. West Red, Red Lake is fifth. Okay. But there was Gold Corp, Endeavor Mining. Leia Gold, Eris, and Noah's Red Lake. I'm employing the same strategy in every one of them. It's a buy and build strategy, which means you have to have expertise in capital markets, expertise in M&A. You have to have great op operating teams. You have to understand political relations. You have to understand community relations. But at the end of the day, it's about buying and building. And it's worked for me, okay? And I'm not saying that... It, it's a formula for everybody, but it worked for me. So I, I have the attitude, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Okay. And so that, that's been fun. But recently I've restaffed my office in Vancouver. We have a few dozen geologists and engineers and some, and they're all gr young and great and enthusiastic and want to, you know, want to get rich. And, and I, and I love it because it, for me, it's okay. Now I've got a tremendous amount of deal flow coming in and we can pick and choose what we like and what we don't like. And it's fun. And, and on the exploration side, you know, the truth is, if you look at guys like Lucas Lundin or Robert Friedland, you know, they got very rich at the end of a drill bit. That's, you know, so that worked for them. You know, so you can become incredibly wealthy, do really well, create great shareholder value at the end of a drill bit. But it got a lot of risk. So I always avoided it. But recently I'm going, well, you know what, at my age, you know, with this group of guys around me that seem to really know what they're doing and can identify great exploration opportunities. Sure, I'll sit at the craps table for, you know, and, you know, until I make a few big scores or until I get severely spanked. But, uh, you know, why not? You know, and it, you know, if, in my position, I can, you know, put a certain amount of money in to something and make it work. And it, if it goes to zero, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt me. But with Black Wolf, it's, I mean, listen, we don't have assays yet. It might be another two weeks before we get assays, but we drilled two properties up, one on the Alaska side of the border, one on the British Columbia side of the border in the Golden Triangle. And boy, they sure look good, but, you know, without the assays, you don't realize. So it's a bit of a crapshoot. Um, I think that maybe we'll make a discovery. And if we don't, we don't. But uh, I think there's a great opportunity to make a discovery. And wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> and I, that, For me, that's just a lot of fun. So I, I want to ask you about the diversity of your business ventures, because you've had success in such a wide variety of businesses over your career, finance, mining, movies, um, more recently olive oil. <laughs> so what's the common denominator of, behind businesses that are so different? Passion, simply. I only do things I love. And I have ADD, so I, you know, I, I like to do a lot. I'm curious. I like to learn about a lot of things. And I like to build. And for me, it's an adventure. And sometimes it's really hard, and sometimes it's easier. I mentioned Lionsgate. Lionsgate was that was a that was not easy. You know, it took three years of my life where I you know lost a lot of sleep and used to lay awake at night staring at the ceiling, going, "What the hell have I done?" And I had to rescue that from uh, from almost going bankrupt before we you know got everything in place and made it work. So it's not always fun, but it is always challenging. No matter what you do, even even olive oil is challenging. Right? I can't seem to find a way to make money with olive oil, but I, I have the best olive oil in the world. Uh, but I can't make money out of it. But I'm just curious, and I'm very passionate, and I love to learn. I love to build, and I love working with people around me that are enthusiastic. And we have a great office in Vancouver that's just, uh, it's a lot of fun. I wasn't going to work a lot. I was working from home a lot, and now I like going to the office. You know, there are people there, and it's 
It's fun, and I love seeing young people, enthusiastic young people, learn and uh, and do well. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you select people to work with and how you build teams that have been so successful? Well, I like working. You know, it's the whole the old thing. You know, work with the devil. You know, you know, and uh, so I've worked with similar people over many many deals. So I know them. I know they're good. We don't always agree on things. We actually often disagree on a lot of things, but they're professionals. They've succeeded. They know how. They know what not to do. You can always figure out how to be successful, but you know how not to do something stupid and go broke. And that's a very important lesson that I think most people should learn. Um, I like tough-minded mining guys that you know are no-nonsense people and just get the job done. Um, so I, you know, I, I like for me meeting a, a new person and backing a new person that I don't know and throwing a lot of money their way. It's a bit of a risk, right? So you know, I've, I've done it, but you know, sometimes it doesn't work. So I just go back to all of. You know, and over the years, you know, we used to have Yorkton Securities back in the 80s, and so I've been in this a long, long time, and you get to meet a lot of people. So, you know, when you're thinking about, well, you know, who can I call on this? And, you know, you know who they are, and they've, you know, they've been around a long time. So, you know, you have a great network, and um, so, you know, I'm lucky that I can pick, pick and choose, because I don't take it that seriously. It's, I don't need this industry to, to have a life. I, I do it because I love it. And so, I, you know, I have the, the freedom to pick and choose. Once again, to Frank Justra and Alicia Hyatt for a dynamite discussion on what is actually happening in the world. This was just a 25-minute excerpt. If you want to hear the whole 40 to 45-minute interview, just go to northernminer.com and look for the videos and the coverage, and you will find them. Thank you once again for joining us. If you want to help out the podcast, please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Share it with your friends. And until next week, take care.